3.7 FM CFBU Brock University right here in St. Catharines, Ontario. Or you could be listening to us uh, streaming online at cfbu.ca. This week, uh, some very, very exciting news. I'm very excited to have on with us the writer from Image Comics, Kel Simmons. He's got a new hot comic out called The Mercenary Sea. They just finished up their first story arc. And uh, it's a great pleasure having you on this week. And thanks so much for coming on, Kel. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's Simon's, but don't worry about it. Everybody gets that. Everybody gets that wrong. Sorry about that. I should have got that with a Y. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this week, uh, my fellow co-host this week that we have, uh, my fellow admin from Ryan's All Things Geek on Facebook, uh, the one, the only Will Mahoney. <laughs> Good afternoon, Rye. Thanks for having me on again. Uh, I cannot think of a more exciting way to spend my lunch hour at work. <laughs> and please tell your uh, bosses that we appreciate uh, them extending your lunch this hour for us. <laughs> I certainly will. So, Kel, um, this is a great story. Um, I want to get started off uh, just talking about Mercenary Sea, and we can get into some other things afterwards. Um, but for me and from the critics online and mostly from social media and those for me are the people that almost really matter the most aside from the critics are the people that are actually reading the books you guys are getting great reviews and i have to say this is a great book and i love the fact that it's not your typical superhero story arc yeah you know i actually i don't read a lot of superhero comics uh or at least i haven't in a in a long time um hey actually you know what comics i read growing up uh, I wasn't allowed to read any sort of superhero stuff anyway. I, I was sort of, uh, I had Archie and the gang foisted on me by my mom, uh, right. you know, and, and, and Richie Rich. And it wasn't until I was a teenager, you know, sort of 15, 16 years old. And I think it probably coincided with the, um, the, bat, the first Batman film, the Tim Burton Batman film coming out that I started reading a lot of Batman comics. Right. And uh, that more than any other superhero comic was, you know, sort of I gravitated towards. Uh, I just I, I, li I liked how dark it was. But, um, you know, my background, my experience is probably more in uh, film and television in terms of, you know, when I was growing up, that's what I was obsessed with movies and to a lesser extent television. Well, so what type of what type of movies was it that you really got yourself into? And is there anything that you kind of fashion your comics after? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, well, you know, certainly Star Wars, yeah, um, of course. Empire Strikes Back. The you know the the, the whole original trilogy uh, was incredibly um, uh, influential in terms of why I wanted to write and create stories. Uh, in fact, I would actually argue that uh, a lot of what I'm doing is just writing for a 12 year old Kel Simons. <laughs> um, you know, just trying to entertain myself. If I weren't doing it in a comic book form or, or you know writing it down, I would probably be doing it with uh, you know action figures and Legos. Right, uh, <laughs> and but, we uh, all <laughs> and some stop motion cameras. Oh, absolutely, yeah, no, I I, I definitely uh, fooled around with that uh, at one point too, but um, yeah, mostly uh, I, I guess what influences the Mercenary Sea uh, has to be Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, definitely you know, see that. Yeah, if you did, if you didn't know when I came across Matthew Reynolds art for the first time I it was on online um, someone uh, io9 had done a, a, a piece about some um, Indiana Jones art that he had done these were all like original uh, adventures that Indy was on uh, there was I think short round was in one of them but they yes, had this very um, layered look to them um, you know they were very, they were all silhouette based which obviously is a big part of his art mm -hmm. um, and uh, they almost look like two-dimensional dioramas uh so anyway I, I reached out to to matthew found his information on deviantart and we started talking and out of those conversations was born the mercenary seed the, both of us had a love of adventure stories uh you know i think maybe on his side of things he he loved the tarzan uh, adventures right. um and um the land that time forgot which is another i believe edgar rice burroughs uh story and on my side of things, it was Raiders of the Lost Ark and also uh, Firefly. Right. To some extent. And I can definitely see the parallels between 
uh, both crews of the Firefly and uh, the Venture. Yeah. So, um, well, it was it, it was it was definitely on purpose. <laughs> yeah. You even have your own little Callie there, which I love. So yeah. <laughs> we haven't seen well, much of her in the la later issues, though. What's that? I, I, we haven't seen much of her in the later issue. This story. Uh, no, she doesn't really come back again until uh, issue six. Right. Um, and I have to say, she came back in a really good and funny way. <laughs> yeah, you know, look, we we had to split up the crew mostly because the story took us in that direction, but mm -hmm. also because. You know, we just really couldn't service. There were nine crew members plus the dog. We couldn't service everyone. Right. And then, of course, we you know we introduce other characters like Chen Z and oh. Mr. Taylor and uh, Evelyn Green. So you know, it was it's difficult to have that huge an ensemble cast. Right. Um, and now with a uh, with Matthew, uh, as we said, uh, Will had mentioned we're both friends with Matthew as well, and we absolutely love his art. And you can definitely see his influences from Indiana Jones in all his silhouette type art. Mm -hmm. But also, you can also see he's got a heavy influence when it comes to, it seems, wartime pieces. Yeah, well, he um, he grew up really loving, I mean, I don't even think, he probably was reading stuff from the 60s and 70s. He grew up loving, like, GI combat comics. Right. Um, so there's a, definitely a lot of that in there. And, you know... Um, one of the reasons I chose to set this against the backdrop of the, the sort of the uh, early days or, or, or um, you know, the, 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 the uh, um, start of World War II was that I wanted to uh, play into his strengths and, and his desire to do um, kind of a wartime comic book. Right. And it works out. It works out so great on so many different levels, too. And the one thing that I've been enjoying the most so far has been the character development that you've had within the crew and not just the crew, but also, you know, with a lot of the subordinate characters that you have on board as well. Now, do you have a conscious effort to fulfill these character roles when you're writing or are you more, you know, geared towards what you want to happen in that issue? Well, I guess I probably, I started with plot before I started with character. Okay. Uh, you know, I certainly had the setting down, and this is this goes back to you know before I actually started writing the scripts. Uh, you know, I had the setting down. I knew the world that I wanted uh, to populate, and then the characters came uh, after that. Um, you know, I, early on in the in the earlier issues, um, I really did sort of make them stock characters in the sense that, again, nine speaking roles uh, is tough to get across yes, and service all of those sort of individual characters. So I started off with like, yeah, this is the sort of gruff uh, World War I vet. This is the, uh, the, the boxer who uh, had to throw fights and you know, was on the run from the, the mob. This is the cute uh, mechanic who's a genius with the, the diesel engines. The hope is that, you know, we get as we go further with the stories that I'll be able to um, not, 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 not just a hope, but the plan is that I'll be able to um, you know, really delve into those characters more deeply and uh, hopefully more satisfactorily for, for, for the readers so that they can really grab hold of these guys. Right. Um, and I think it, it started happening towards the end of the first arc. Yeah, and I, I saw that as well. Um, but like you said, you had to split up the cast, especially with the, the nature of the first story arc, you know, um, and Captain Jack being kind of separated from most of his crew from a lot yeah. of it. Um, but I can see... You know what, that's going to happen more and more as the series continues. Uh, you know, I sort of have the next few years planned out, and I, I know the moments when the you know Jack is going to go off and deal with this particular adventure, and you know we'll cut back and forth with the crew, obviously, but it's really going to be on Jack's shoulders to to take the story forward. Mm -hmm. Right, which is, is basically the format of any series where you've got an adventure and, as you said, so many characters. I mean, it's the old Star Trek model of yeah. Kirk going on the away mission. Right, right, exactly. I like oh, it. You know, Kel, I, I wanted to say something quickly also. Uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier is the fact of how you were drawn to Batman, the movie, in 1989 and the, the darkness in it. That's one of the things I have to say that I really enjoy about the book as well is that, you know, it spans very different moods and it's not just it's it handles mature content, but it's not blood and guts. It's not grim and gritty. It's not like all doom and gloom. You do, in, in, in fact, have humor in there. And I think 
Matthew's art helps convey all of that. So that was, you know, obviously a very good fit there because he definitely does have that World War II uh-huh. era influence. And, you know, funnily enough, considering the, the, the funny cameo that was in issue six, you definitely see a little bit <laughs> yeah. of Doug Wadley's art in his style and maybe even a little Sam Glansman, who were very famous for doing the milieu that you're covering. Yeah. Yeah, was, was that yeah. cameo... Um, and not to, I try. I hope not to give away too much of a spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read read it yet. But was the Johnny Quest thing uh, a conscious effort by <laughs> between uh, the two you of you? You know what? I wanted a cameo. Here, here's. The, I'll tell you the background of, of that. Um, uh, another sort of big influence I, I in in crafting the story for me was Howard Hawks. The the films of Howard Hawks, uh, in particular, stuff like Rio Bravo, right. uh, To Have and Have Not. <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, only angels have wings, and, and maybe to a slightly lesser extent, the thing from another world. I, I, I love those films. Um, they're all sort of these ensemble pieces, characters who are, um, you know, kind of thrown together. Um, most of them are on the outs of society for one reason or another, uh, and they, uh, you know, come together and try to eke out an existence in some frontier, whether it's the Arctic or a South American jungle or Martinique during the, uh, during the war. So, um, that was a big influence. So in writing, um, the scripts, uh, anytime I, I said, anytime we go to the Cardinal point, which is the sort of their home base bar, uh, on their, um, on the, uh, Island of South right. Haven, I said, I'd like to see, um, characters from those movies just in the background, just, you know, sort of the subtle, uh, nod and a wink to Howard Hawks. But when we came around to doing the sixth issue, um, obviously the influences and, um, um, attempt to sort of, uh, recreate the, the great Johnny quest, uh, original series right. was picked up on by a number of our critics and fans. And, uh, Matthew had actually surprised me by having, um, race and, and Dr. Quest in there. And I'm, I, initially I was like, ah, I don't know, that might be too on the nose. But then I was like, you know what? It totally works. Let's, let's go for it. And you know, I've gotten a couple of responses. People, people dig it. Yeah. So that, that was yep. the general response that everyone, everyone kind of loved it. Yeah. Cause yeah, I know, I, mean, I know I did. And well, <laughs> you and I, yeah, so talked I, I did. honestly, I, I didn't think it was distracting at all, especially considering the fact you didn't like have them with any dialogue, they're just in the background. Hanging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, um, Matthew's original version had them at, sitting at a table with Mr. Taylor, and I'm like, no, no, it's got to be way more subtle than that. They got to be in the background, right? Uh, anyway, I, I think that piece worked out really well. I love it, and uh, so this is like you said, this is something you have planned to do every time when they're there. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that that's the plan. Whether or not we can actually execute it is uh, is another thing entirely. Now, are there some that I've missed already? Do, do I have to go back and no, read some? No, of my they, that was actually the, only the second time. I think the first time was in the in the first issue, um, but we just didn't have the real estate to play it out. Oh, okay. uh, to be honest with you, uh, there was the action of them running into their old nemesis Connor and his crew. I see. No, who will be back? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the the first story arc is coming to an end. Um, oh, it's it's actually it's it's over. Yeah. Six the sixth issue wrapped that up. Yeah, sorry, I, I misspoke there. Uh, it is come to an end. Now, if you just want, if you wouldn't mind, if you want to give our our listeners uh, those who maybe have not had a chance to go out and pick up this comic, which I strongly suggest you do, and if it's not in your local comic book shop, ask your local comic book. Uh, comic book shop owner to bring that comic in because you will not be disappointed. Do you want to give them just kind of like an overall of the first story arc uh, of, about Captain Jack and his crew? Sure, sure. Um, so it's Jack Harper, who's an ex bootlegger, who um, has basically a crew of mercenaries and fortune hunters uh, in the South Seas of China during the uh, Japanese invasion of China. Um, and we dole out a little information that they actually used to be mercenaries for the Chinese Navy and ran afoul of uh, this guy, Admiral Shatang, who basically double-crossed them, and they ended up taking the boat as uh, repayment for that double-cross. Uh, so they're now kind of tooling around the South Seas, uh, looking for the next gig, but through it all is this thread of uh, an island that Jack has heard rumors of, uh, this place called Kojira, which uh, is rumored to have had have, have these sort of this fantastic treasure and a civilization 
that's uh, far advanced, uh, and uh, there's sort of a lot of dangers, you know, um, all sorts of monsters. So it's it's definitely uh, inspired by like Skull Island from the King Kong uh, original King Kong movie. Right. Uh, but the sort of overall thread for the first six issues is they get hired by an American spy who needs them to. Um, go behind enemy lines uh, in uh, the coast of China and pick up an agent, Top Hat, uh, who uh, was on the run since the Japanese took Shanghai. Which is one of my favorite and, characters. <laughs> and the agent Might has as well. this uh, information about the Japanese uh, war effort because the Americans and the British know that eventually uh, we're going to be headed towards uh, war with these guys. Wow. And that's that. <laughs> it, and that was the first right. story arc. And you know what? It, it was, it's one of those stories that right from the very first panel of the first issue, it takes you in. Like Matt's art brings you in right away. And then you have this style of storytelling and writing that's, one, very real, and two, really witty and funny. Like Jack Harper, when I, when I see the captain... I have trouble not seeing Captain Mal Duncan and Han Solo, you know, mixed together here. Oh yeah. Um, it, now, is that was that something done on purpose as well? Or well, is that, yeah. I mean, um, or is he made up for more clearly, than that? Clearly, Mal. You know, as I said, uh, I was uh, I was basing this uh, partly on Firefly, or you know, as an homage to Firefly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 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 I guess I kind of when I talked to uh, Image about doing this, I pitched it as Raiders meets Firefly. And I also said, "Is like, look, this is for everybody who misses the crew of fire of, of this of Serenity, um, and this is for everybody whose childhood was ruined by the uh, last uh, Indiana Jones film." <sighs> so, um, anyway, <laughs> great, it, great description. Yeah, they were on board, uh, but um, you know, clearly Mal Reynolds is an influence. But obviously, Joss Whedon based Mal Reynolds on Han Solo, so I got to go back to that original source. Right. And uh, there are actually these. Um, these three books that were published in the late seventies. This was before the expanded universe of star Wars became. Are you, the, are you talking about the, uh, Brian Daly trilogy? I'm talking about the Brian Daly trilogy. Yes. Nice. Uh, uh, which is if, if, if you don't know is, um, Han and Chewie before the events of, uh, star Wars, mm-hmm. a new hope. Uh, and, um, you know, them basically just trying to stay afloat, uh, as they're, uh, taking one job after another. That was the inspiration, obviously, for um, for Jack and his crew. Right, and obviously there there is a long history of the lovable rogue, which is why oh, yeah. all those characters that we've just discussed have caught on. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Everybody likes a scoundrel. Exactly. <laughs> yes, they do. They just don't. We like all wish being we could be that cool. <laughs> and actually, you know what, Kel? I have to say that's one of the great things. Also, as you know, uh, Ryan was saying about how you sucked us in from the beginning. I, I like the nice homage kind of to Raiders of, but with the twist that it's not that Harper and his crew are on the, the run from natives. It's that they're sitting down and watching a movie. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love that scene as well. Or <laughs> sorry, that, that panel. Yeah. No, that was a favorite of mine as well. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, there's so many, there's so many tips of the hat to so many different genres and so many different loves from, uh, at least from my youth and Will's as well. Uh, is this something that's going to be continuing on with uh, the Mercenary Sea, or is this something that happens with your comics, whether it be this or any of the other ones that you write? Well, you know, it's funny. I, 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 I'm going to say yes on both accounts. Um, I'm certainly not going to let up in terms of um, those homages to some of my favorite adventure stories and um, you know, movies and books that I enjoyed as a kid, as I've, as I've said. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if you ever read my comic series, uh, I love trouble, which is the first thing I'd ever written, uh, that I did with image. Uh, it too has this, uh, kind of pop culture sensibility, um, probably less in the actual story, but I, I made sure that the artist layered in these sort of winks and nods to certain things. Like there's a jaws reference and star Wars reference, what have you. Um, uh, Buffy references as right. well, so you know I I, I just enjoy doing that. Uh, it's sort of the MST3K in me uh, to nice. sort of drop these little pop culture bombs on people. Right. Uh, and then the next series that I have coming coming out uh, called Rain is also very steeped in the those sort of same influences. It's um, 
it's, it's got a bit of a swords and sorcery bent, um, you know, different uh, uh, genre for me. But it's uh, inspired by it. I had recently started reading in the last few years the original Robert Howard Conan stories, right. which I'd never really read, uh, and was just sort of blown away with by how uh, how well written they were how uh, ahead of their time they seemed. Uh, you know, when they consider that they're written in the 30s, they mm-hmm. seem very contemporary. They certainly hold up. And I just, I felt uh, fueled to do something in that vein. And it sure made uh, watching the Arnold Schwarzenegger versions <laughs> a lot different. Yes, yep. yes. And, That's and what it's I an interesting thing, really. if you noticed, since you, what you just said about how they seem very timely, do you ever notice, it's, which is probably one of the reasons also that you set Mercenary Sea when you did, that a quote-unquote period piece seems ageless, however something set now always seems aged? Oh, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it, uh, something five minutes ago just seems out of place in contemporary time, but you can always tell a great old story. Exactly. Well, I'm still waiting for someone to come out with a, a new take on Robin Hood, but set back then still. Yeah, um, you know, they actually tried it with the, the Ridley Scott, Russell Crowe movie. Um, mm. It didn't work because they threw out the original idea. If you didn't know, uh, the original story that prompted them to um, to make that film was a different slant on the tale where um, the Sheriff of Nottingham was actually the hero. Oh, wow. Uh, yep. And turns out Robin was sort of a spoiled rich kid who... Um, had gotten in trouble and blamed for a series of um, thefts and the sheriff Nottingham is investigating the crime and realizes he's been set up. And uh, anyway, it was, it was a really cool script um, that they unfortunately turned into a fairly standard Robin Hood story that didn't offer much to the, no. to the canon, I'm afraid. Nothing new nope. at all. That's, that's yeah, I'm, a, I'm a huge Robin Hood fan and would love uh, to do that. But, there's just not mu- there's not much that hasn't been done in the world of Robin Hood. Right. Yeah, that, and that's that's true. And that's the same. I think the same problem with because I was a big Robin Hood fan growing up. My three favorites were Robin Hood, Zorro, and the Lone Ranger. And to, yeah, a, and to a lesser extent, the, Billy yeah. the Kid, who yeah. was real. <laughs> but uh, they've all been done to death. You know. There's, yeah. I mean, there's... the you know one of the better versions of the story that I can think of was the '70s film Robin and Marion with um, Yes, Sean Connery. And Audrey Hepburn. And Audrey Hepburn. It's, you know, and it's, Captain Quint, Robert Shaw. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a heartbreaking film. It's a sort of the, the, the autumn years of Robin and Marion. Exactly. And, and for that matter, what's really interesting about it is it tells the conclusion of the story that Howard Pyle told. Yeah. Every other adaptation of Robin Hood gives it a happy ending. They're like, oh, no, he won. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well... I love getting into this part about uh, the movies and everything. And actually, that's something I'd like to get back into uh, once we get yeah. back from break, if you don't mind. Uh, see sure. what uh, if you'd had any aspirations at all for uh, breaking into the movies, script writing, or anything like sure. that. Sure, we can talk about that. And uh, we're going to get right back to that. Just remember, everyone, uh, you're listening right now to Rat G on 103.7 FM CFBU, Brock University right here in St. Catharines. Or you can listen to us live on CFBU.ca. I want to say thank you to all those of you listening around the globe, as you do every week. It uh, blows me away, even though it's only probably seven of you, but still, you're all over the world, so thank you for listening. Um, I do want to send a shout-out, though, to uh, the guys over at Touchstone Site Contractors. They listen to us every week while they uh, do their work out there. You guys work hot out, out in the hot sun every day. Uh, just want to say thanks for your continued support. If anybody ever needs any help with contracting and stuff like that, go please see these guys at Touchstone Site Contractors. Ask for my buddy Steve over there. He'll set you in the right direction. So, with that being said, this week, as you know, we are interviewing Mr. Cal Simons. Simmons. Well, I will never get it right. I'm just telling you that. Simons. Right I know, but you know what? I'm going to get it wrong every single time because I have... Now you're thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking about it, and I also have the memory of 10 Second Ted, so... <laughs> Hi, <laughs> my name's Ted. write it down phonetically. Yeah, exactly. I have to know how to spell that first. Put an S, <laughs> an eyeball, and Mons. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I don't do uh, any live hosting anymore. No. <laughs> so, no, but we're, uh, we've been talking about your, uh, your hit comic, uh, The Mercenary Sea with Image Comics. Um, 
Image has got a, a great rep for bringing on great writers, great artists, and doing great stories that are against archetype for comic books. Yeah, I mean, they they really are the the only place, well, obviously the only place I've ever worked, but the only place I probably need to work. <laughs> now, who who founded Image? Uh, well, I guess it was, uh, was it seven guys from Marvel and DC? It was yes. Life in them, right? And, um, I, I think Ryan Moore meant, you know, how did you end up getting over to Image? Oh, oh, I see, I see. Well, um, actually, I'm a... Uh, I do write for film and TV, um, and for oh, wow. years I was an executive uh, in, in the business. Um, I worked for a producer named Mace Newfeld, who you probably know from all the Tom Clancy movies. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I worked on a number of films with him. I was the head of his development. We worked on The General's Daughter and uh, Asylum and Sahara. And the last movie I worked on was Invictus. Um, oh, wow. So, nice. Um, and then I was there for about 10 years, but I'd originally came out here to be a writer. I, I live in Los Angeles. So I'd originally come out to LA to be a writer. Uh, and in the last five years or so, I really sort of started focusing on that, um, both in the world of features, but also in comic books. Um, I knew Eric, uh, Stevenson, the publisher at image for a number of years. Um, actually one of the projects I set up as a development executive was the, was Powers, Brian Michael Bendis' comic, right. when it was still published by Image, uh, as, a, as a movie at uh, Columbia Pictures. Oh, uh, this nice. Was like, this is around 2000. And um, actually, Eric and I had already known each other through other channels, but, uh, you know, so I guess that's sort of the, the, the origins of our relationship. And he's always been like, hey, you know, look, if you ever got any ideas, you should pitch them to me. Uh, eventually, he actually brought me the idea for... Um, I Love Trouble, so I worked on that for uh, six issues, and uh, it was supposed to be part of a much bigger world. There was going to be um, other artists and creators involved with shaping a sort of shared universe. Nice. Uh, uh, people with powers, but they don't put on capes and tights and become superheroes or supervillains, so that was the, no, they that just was the premise of people. it. Unfortunately, it just never came together, and um, I Love Trouble was really the only comic series that made it to to production mm -hmm. uh, and just never really found an audience unfortunately yeah so. i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to check for that one because i don't i don't think i've yeah. ever read that one I, the only <laughs> the only one that i i keep thinking of is the nick nolte movies yes yes, yes <laughs> which i, I, I i'm, it I'm assuming that. it's not an uh, adaptation <laughs> it is not yes odds are it's better than the nick nolte movie uh, uh, you know i've actually <laughs> never seen that one but no neither let's hope <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't see the nick nolte movie. no it's okay i'm gonna i'm gonna admit that I'm cheating here and I'm checking out your IMDB page here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the Bob Newhart show, group therapy, uh, well, yeah, I do, producing um, and directing. Yeah, I do um, basically documentaries sometimes. Yeah. Um, I did a documentary called The Dungeon Masters a few years back about Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games in general. Oh, fantastic. Um, but I also have done, uh, I did this uh, what was essentially supposed to be a DVD extra for a box set of Mel Brooks films that the Shout Factory put out. Uh, we're basically a, a friend of mine and I, Matthew Bazell, um, wrote and directed and produced a, a series of interviews that became a documentary about the creation of the 2,000-year-old uh, man uh, comedy routine that Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner had done. Right. That ended up uh, airing on PBS and on Turner Classic Movies, which was probably one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me, to have Robert Osborne introduce a documentary that I made. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, and so then I, also, I think I actually saw that documentary, so that's, oh, that's very cool. ironic. Oh. Uh, so I've, I've worked with Shout Factory on a number of other projects that are basically DVD extras. Uh, I did a thing last year on um, the Bob Newhart show for a box set of the original six, uh, four, six seasons of that show. Uh, where I sat down with Bob and some of the cast and talked about the show. Now, what was and, that like? Uh, what, what is Bob Newhart like? Does he honestly he's pause that nice much guy. in real very life? Very approachable, uh, very sharp, still very funny. <laughs> nice. It was a it was a real treat actually to sit down with him for a few hours and, and just uh, I basically turned the camera on and let them talk about the show. Oh, that's fantastic! And, uh, so that was a lot of fun. And um, last summer I did some work with Shout. Uh, I interviewed all of the cast and crew of the of Pee Wee's Playhouse. Oh, wow. 
They're doing a uh, box set of the entire Pee Wee's Playhouse series on Blu-ray, I think comes out later on this year. So did you get to interview Lawrence Fishburne as well? I got to interview Lawrence Fishburne, oh, and wow. I got to talk to him about Hannibal, which was like one of my favorite shows that's on the air. Fantastic. Uh, and, I, and, I made him, and I made him laugh because I told him the, sh- the show always makes me very hungry. <laughs> it's on a great table. So that was a that was a Fantastic. highlight of that. One. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played indeed. <laughs> yes. So I got to interview uh, John Singleton, who was a PA on the show. Oh, you're kidding me. Uh, I'm not. John Singleton is, was a PA on Pee Wee's. Was a production assistant and security guard on the P- on Pee Wee's play. Well, I can see the security guard part. <laughs> Anyone who's seen John Singleton, that's a large man. Yeah. Yeah, so he that's not someone you'd want to mess with. That that's uh, amazing. So who who in your opinion has been your 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 blow your mind interview so far? Uh god, who I, I mean I I'd have to say New Art was was up there. Um I, it's a split it's a tie between New Art and Fishburne. I yeah. mean, I don't do it all that often, so it's it's not like it's a uh, it's something I I, I uh, not a huge I've got like a, uh, list. a whole list of guys that I've I've interviewed, but it, it's kind of funny. I mean, you know, I, I interviewed Paul Reiser for uh, for the 2,000-year-old man thing, which was kind of cool. And, right. um, uh, you know, having grown up watching Mad, Mad About, About You. you. And, and I, I brought my Starlog Aliens uh, Collector's Edition, and I just showed it. I was like, look, I just <laughs> wanted to let you know I, I, I what I remember you is Burke from Aliens. Right. <laughs> she thought it was pretty cool. Could you please pop your collar? Yeah. <laughs> please pop your collar. That's fantastic. <laughs> So, uh, so then, what, what's uh, what's next then for you in uh, the age of uh, film, at least on that side of things? Uh, well, I'm um, writing a a movie that I can't talk about for okay. Disney, um, but it's a remake mm-hmm. of one of their classic titles. Oh, fantastic! Uh, I am uh, do I did a horror film for Universal. Um, oh, is that part of their new uh, initiative to do a cohesive? Monster Universe, or is it something else? Uh, something different. It's a it's it's a voodoo uh, film set in New Orleans. Oh, those are always so, good. Uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, I'm doing. Um, uh, there's a script that I wrote called "If They Move, Kill 'Em," which is about um, Sam Peckinpah, the director. Yes. Kind nice. of a weird uh, week in his later on in his career, sort of his waning, waning years of his career. That uh, hopefully we'll get into production next year. That's the plan, anyway. Uh, I also just recently worked on um, the Game of Thrones video game for oh, wow. this company called Telltale Games that do the Walking yes. Dead and Fables games. So is it going to be style? Do you know uh, if I can ask anything about the gameplay for that? Is that going to be more style? It'll be like, it'll Walking, be like Dead? Uh, Walking Dead and, and Fables. It'll be a story-based game. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Set I like in the Game of Thrones universe. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. They've got some great stuff, and it sounds like you got an awful lot on your plate. This combined it, with it all uh, sort of writing. came together, right? The the comics and, and movies. Uh, it takes a while to you know sort of get a foothold in probably either industry, and both just sort of happened at the same time. Now, one thing we've talked about over and over over the past few weeks has been the boom of the comic book industry when it comes to comic book movies and comic uh-huh. book television series and. Just the general acceptance of comic books as it is. Yeah. I have yeah, never it, seen anything they, that's lasted this long. That's legitimate. Yeah. And do you, like, normally when these genres come along, you know, we'll get a vampire craze like we did with Anne Rice back in, you know, the early 90s. And then it kind of dies down. You see them again back in, you know, the 2000s with the Twilights. And the same things with werewolves yeah. or aliens or whatever it should yeah, be. Everything is cyclical. But it doesn't seem to be that way with comic books. It seems ever since Burton they've just kept coming and coming and coming. Well, with they, even I mean, a lot of them that people ever, don't ever know since about. Batman, they, you know, Superman and Batman in the 80s obviously sort of popped the top on the comic book adaptation, but you can point to countless bad versions and, you know, sort of True. aborted attempts to make comic book movies. It really wasn't until Iron Man um, sort of solidified uh, what the comic book movie should be. And, you mm-hmm. know, had people involved in it that paid tribute to the series and didn't try to quote unquote Hollywoodize it. So Robert Downey Jr. saved comic book movies. <laughs> I mean, it, although, you know, I, I give a little credit to John Favreau. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Very yeah. true. Well, well that and also, which, you know, Ryan and I have discussed often, it's the fact that 
also Marvel is now behind the movies. They're not just signing away yes. the character. It's they're yeah, the no, studio. Exactly. They're well, they making f- the movies and and. Uh, to I, be I fair, mean, I like the just... Blade movies, and I don't think they made Blade though. No, yeah, they that was did. New Line. Well, Blade, the Blade movies were, I believe, New Line, and mm-hmm. and you know the first one was really good, actually. Yeah, the second one wasn't. You know, so I guess bad. I'm, I'm also sort of forgetting, uh, you know, before Iron Man, uh, the X Men movies. Exactly. Uh, certainly, the, the first two were really good. Exactly. And, and they've, they... they've come back around with the the first first class movies for me. Mm-hmm. Yes, me too. Yeah. No. But look, uh, my you know unsolicited opinion, or I guess you are soliciting, <laughs> is that uh, like everything, it is cyclical. I think eventually um, audiences will tire of the superhero genre. They will be tired of the Superman and want stories that they can relate to. Right. It happens all the time. I mean. Um, even in the 60s and 70s, the sort of big Hollywood spectacles uh, gave way to smaller films like um, Easy Rider and, uh, you know, uh, even The Conversation. The Conversation, The Exorcist, right. Sorcerer. All the President's Men. All the President's Men. All, you know, I mean, the 70s is probably my favorite era of films mm-hmm. to begin with. But, uh, you know, filmmaking changed. And we're on the precipice of another change, I think. Um, and what does that mean then for these studios, though, that have put all this money into their, you know, well, ten year look, and twenty year plans? There's no sign that it's going to slow down or stop anytime soon. When I'm talking about it being cyclical, I'm sure it's going to be five or ten years in the making. Right. Uh, you know, we certainly know that Marvel has a long term plan for all of their characters. Uh, it certainly seems that DC is starting to shape that up as well, mm-hmm. and the studios are putting a lot of money and um, uh, hope and faith on these movies doing very well. They're not all going to do well, but I would say it seems like they're on the right path for the majority of them to, to you know, to find a, a big audience. Right. Uh, unfortunately, that sort of squeezes out the smaller films, um, if you want to say, quote, unquote, adult entertainment. But, um, I, you know, these movies are so smart and sharp that they're for everybody. Exactly. Right. And but, you know, and, I, I do know, you know, having spoken to a lot of my friends who are writers and directors and producers that um, there is a bit of a squeeze on projects that don't have that giant scope or don't have uh, the intellectual property rights behind it. Uh, you know, whether it's a Harry Potter or, a, or an Iron Man. Right. right. Which which is actually a shame because if the story is good enough, the audience is there. Because Absolutely. I saw John Favreau's movie Chef. Uh-huh. Uh, and I'm putting it in the top five of the movies I've seen this summer. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, yeah no, I mean, look, uh, mileage it, varies all with everything, right? Yeah, like no, no matter what it is, there's a reason why Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors. Not everybody <laughs> likes vanilla or, or or chocolate, right? So, exactly. But usually, you know, I said the whole majority. But people respond to good films. Um, Hollywood doesn't always put out good films. No, but <laughs> unfortunately, they, bad Channing Tatum really well. Yeah, but hey, look, nobody nobody sets out to make a bad movie. That yeah. that is an absolute truism. Nobody Are you sure out. about that with Nicolas Cage I'm, though? With the exception <laughs> of like Sharknado, <laughs> right? Yes. That is that is clearly intended to be a spoof of a, a you know action horror film. But you know, think about a number of the movies that came out. Even like uh, you know, we were talking about the X Men, the third X Men, the Last Stand. Mm-hmm. I don't like it, no. but it didn't start. They didn't make it going. Well, let's really make the worst of the three of these films. Right. They had high ambitions. They always do, and you know things happen. Thing, I, if I'm not mistaken, the director was replaced like weeks before production. Right. So Twice. it's not like yeah. So it's not like it was his vision throughout the the production, and that's definitely going to affect uh, how uh, how things uh, come out. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and of course, the the irony though with with film being a business as well as an art is that you can have some really terrible films make a lot of money. And part of that's because of the fact that people like the prior film that was much better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So guys, I just want to take a, just a quick break and we're going to continue this. I just want to remind everybody that you are listening to 103.7 FM CFBU Brock university radio here in St. Catharines, Ontario, or if you are listening online somewhere around the world, you are listening to us at CFBU.ca. This is rat G. This we are from Ryan's all things geek. And this is Ryan Fleming with my co-host Will Mahoney. And, uh, 
we're, we're having a pretty good conversation going here with uh, our buddy Cal. Um, I love the fact that you've started, not that you started in the movies, but the fact that you, you get to straddle both worlds because you can really see the parallel um, for anyone who's done any script writing or anything like that or anyone who just is a, a pure movie person. You can see the parallels um, from a movie and how it's laid out to a comic book. It's very, very much the same as a storyboard. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's, there's not much different between how I write a screenplay for a film or TV series or how I do a script for uh, an issue of the mercenary scene. Um, I write cinematically. I write very visually. Um, I do lay out for the most part, all of the action sequences. Right. Uh, um, but uh, you know, the, the difference is that a screenplay is a document that's designed to be read by maybe a hundred people. Uh, whereas the script for the mercenary sea is really just a conversation between Matthew and I, right? Uh, no, one, no one else gets to see that. basically. <laughs> no, we, so, we get to see the end product. Yes. Yes. But you know, it's a much more personal document and, and, you know, as I said, um, you know, I actually write as though I'm directing, I guess, in a mm -hmm. sense, um, you know, the panels, I'll say, this is a medium shot. This is a wide angle shot. This is an aerial shot. If I were writing a screenplay, I would never put those directions in because that's actually not my job. Right. That's a director's job right. or a director for some director of photography's job. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't have to, I don't have to talk about what the character's wearing because the customer is going to take care of that. Right. So you leave that up to Matthew, but you, well, like the the costumes and stuff, do you leave up to Matthew? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, look, he he gave me sketches before we started, and I, I, I with some of the characters, I definitely said, okay, uh, Wolf wears a, a battered uh, captain's hat with the insignia removed from a from a, the German Navy circuit World War One, right? Because that was an important character part. Uh, we did argue a bit on the uh, shoulder holster for for, uh, for Jack. Jack, uh, he had a more traditional, and I'm like, no, no, it's got to be like a tanker from World War II, mm -hmm. uh, or it's sort of like not a shoulder holster, but it's like on the chest, uh, kind of like the old uh, Nick Fury, uh, yeah, exactly. During Stranko. I guess, yeah. I, I, I again never really read a lot of Nick Fury, but I, I'm sure that that is it. I'm sure that's it exactly. <laughs> I, I took I took screen caps of um, Band of Brothers and sent and sent them to him. Like this is what you need to do. Now, how much when it comes to when it comes to a period piece like uh, the Mercenary Sea, mm -hmm. how much you know how much research do you put into keeping it set to the time for you know like w w just going to things like dialect because you know we don't speak the same way today that we did back then. Yeah, you know, um, well. Sort of the broader question about research is I do just enough to get the facts right. Right. But if I need to change something in support of story as opposed to history, I'm going to come down on the side of story all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not writing a – you know, this is not a history book about the Sino-Japanese War. Exactly. It's not uh, an anthropology class about uh, uh, Pacific Island cultures. Um, nor is it the instruction manual on how to operate a UB3 U-boat. So, you know, we're, we're going to play with that stuff uh, when it's necessary. But, I, you know, I try to keep it as grounded in reality as possible. Um, you know, I'm actually ex-military, so I also am oh. sort of keen on um, weaponry being accurate. So that's kind of a thing that I bring to the table, a little OCD that I uh, bring to the table. Fortunately, as I said, Matthew's a big fan of uh, sort of combat comics, so he gets it right almost mm -hmm. all the time. And I was actually going to ask you if you or Matthew or both of you had family members that were military because everything that I do see so much from you guys seems to be so heavily based in, you know, World War II and, you know, well, previous you know, wars. I don't know about Matthew, but my, you know, my grandparents' generation all served. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandfather was a... Um, Actually, I believe he was, uh, was, a, was a lieutenant JG, and he worked in the torpedo room of a destroyer. Oh wow! During World War II, and all of my all of uh, my his wife, my grandmother's brothers, all served in the Navy, and one of them actually died uh, in in service. Um, yeah, and, but that was it. I mean, you know, my father missed out on World, on, on Vietnam, and uh, I served uh, in the late eighties, early nineties. And were you Navy as well, or? 
Uh, Army infantry. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. A grunt, as they say. Oh, what's that? A grunt. Yes, <laughs> yeah. actually, I was I was mechanized. <laughs> oh, wow. Ah, so it's over tanky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, mechanized mechanized infantry. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, as my uh, alarm goes off on my <laughs> phone for the best reason that there possibly is, is because it is time for us to take a quick break there. Um, so, Kel, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left in the show here before we hit the break. Um, there are a few things that I'm going to want to get into when we get back from break. I'm okay. really interested in hearing more about Rain, um, also about uh, the trade paperback when that will be released for the Mercenary C. And, you know, what's next What's next on, uh, on board for you and okay. uh, possibly Image Comics? So I just want to say thanks to everybody. We are going to be right back after this uh, message. Again, you're listening to 103.7 FM, CFBU, Brock University Radio. You're listening to Rat G from Ryan's All Things Geek, where you can find us on Facebook. As well, if you want to listen to us online, CFBU.ca. And we will be right back. Um, we're just into our last uh, segment here. I'm having a great time talking Mercenary C here. Um, guys... This has been a very intriguing and interesting show. You know, it's not often you can get the background on something that you love, you know, especially when it comes to your hobbies and things like that. Finding out the people that are behind the scenes that are, are making these things. And, you know, even for a greater degree, you know, talking to people that are creating people and stories that, you know, you come to know and love. And, Kel, I, I often wonder... Do you, when you're writing a good story, do you start to feel any type of, you know, you owe it to the fan for something? Or do you write the story for yourself? Is there a certain point where you stop writing a story for, for a 12-year-old Cal? Yeah. And you start writing uh, for your fans? You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. We haven't reached that point yet where <laughs> I, I'm definitely writing for myself. I, I, I that, that sounds very self-serving and selfish, but I'm sorry. That's probably the best answer I can give. Um, okay. I'm the first reader, so I've got to entertain me more than anything. Right. Um, that's not to say that um, I don't think about, um, you know, sort of the, the, the end of the line, the, 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 the reader who's, you know, picking up our books and spending their hard-earned money to, um, you know, check out and see what we're doing. Um, I think about it, that in terms of, all right, you know, do I need an action sequence here? You know, this is a comic book. We need to, we need to keep things rolling. Exactly. But, uh, you know, for the most part, it comes naturally, I think. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so it, it doesn't always come easily, but it comes naturally. And to be fair, you know, uh, Stan Lee, right before Timely Comics was about to fold, or almost folded, um, that's when he decided to create Fantastic Four and just write it his way and make it for himself. And that was one of the best decisions in comic books. Obviously, yes. Yeah, because without yes. that, you know, there's no Marvel and there's probably no DC yeah. anymore either. Never try, to, never try to write for the market. Never right. try to think, oh, you know what? You know, and of course, all my all my references are, are Hollywood references. But you know, if you think that Hollywood needs a talking dog movie or that's what they're looking for, don't write a talking dog movie. <laughs> <laughs> don't 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 write it simply because you think somebody's going to buy it. But write if, it because you have a story to tell. Um, and and it just it, happens and, to feature a talking dog. Yeah, or if that with the happens, voice of Channing Tatum. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, awesome. Yeah. So that uh, I guess that's my answer uh, to that one. Well, that, well, that's good. Well, okay. So uh, let's get into uh, the last couple things here, just before we run out of time here. Um, Actually, Kel, I, I had a, a quick question, which does yeah. dovetail into what we're about to get into. Uh, earlier, when you were talking about Mercenary C, you had mentioned you know Skull Island being an influence, and you mentioned monsters. Are you talking literally or figuratively? As spoiler-free as you can possibly be, of course. Well, I mean, we've certainly intimated in the comic so far that the island of Kojira has fantastic beasts on it. You know, sort of an island out of time. Um, you know, the whole sort of width and breadth of this series is ultimately Jack's quest for Kojira. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a number of years of stories planned out. We're not getting there for a while. <laughs> well, but, I still I look forward to reading the the trip. Yeah, I mean that you know it's 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 really about the journey, not the destination. Gotcha. Well, thanks for that. No, but when it does come to this, we do, we have been wondering though. Uh, with the first story arc, you finished that all up. You said mm -hmm. you've got things coming. You've got everything kind of mapped out for the future. Yeah. So, 
for the people that haven't got the chance to read the first story arc, that's going to be coming out on trade paperback soon. When's that yeah, going to be hitting Yeah, that'll be out uh, September 3rd. In fact, uh, uh, putting it to bed, uh, putting the, the, the layout to bed this week. Um, so that'll be September 3rd, um, collecting the first six issues. We've got about 10 pages of extras. Oh, awesome. Uh, all for the low price of nine ninety nine. So nice. Definitely a bargain. Make sure your friends know about it. And we threw in a lot of extras there. So even if you're already a fan and have collected all the single issues, you'll still want to pick it up. And we're not going to not going to break the bank doing it either. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. And you, right. Kel, you had also mentioned before we started recording that you had a uh, built-in hiatus for the book. When does yeah, that end? Yeah, so we're um, we're going to be back with original stories in November, November fifth will be issue seven of the mercenary sea. And that's simply in there because it takes, um, you know, many weeks to months for Matthew to catch up with the art, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he's actually scripting, uh, issues, uh, sorry, um, drawing issue seven right now. Um, we're also going to have like a little, uh, short story that's going to be included in our, uh, December issue, uh, a little Christmas bonus basically. And then we're going to take uh, January off, and then in February of 2015, we will have a straight run of eight issues, one every month uh, through October. And that will, be a new, that will be a new story arc um, that basically, uh, I've mentioned Firefly, obviously, as, a, as an influence. That's basically right. going to be our Out of Gas episode, where nice. we're going to flash back to how the crew came together for the first time. Oh, awesome. And that will dovetail with a uh, contemporary story and adventure that they have to go on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is one thing that I did actually want to mention that I, I do love about the story. Is you did something that the movie The Guardians of the Galaxy did. And you just threw us in without the backstory. Like, yeah. yeah. You just, <laughs> you're just like, here's, here's the cast, here's the crew, here's the story. Hop on board and we'll catch you up as we go. And I think that works best. I think a lot of times and a lot of stories are kind of wasted on introducing the characters right off the bat with a big origin story. Um, is that well, something you thought about big, beforehand? Big or? Kind of guy. I, I love to start things in the middle and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work back towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll fill in those, those questions. I, I, you know, some of our harsher critics uh, definitely complain. It was like, well, who are these guys? I'm like, you know what? They're guys on an adventure. That's all you need to know right now. We'll exactly. I mean, you know what? We didn't get Indiana Jones's backstory when yeah. he showed up. Exactly. He, he just walked out of the shadows in Peru. Yeah. 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 And got chased down by a big boulder. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you've got uh, the the other uh, big comic coming from uh, Image as well, Rain. Yeah, I've got a new series called Rain, R E Y N, uh, that I'm doing with Nate Stockman, who was the artist who came in and did the sixth issue of I Love Trouble when. The original artist and co-creator, uh, Mark Robinson, was unable to uh, finish it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing that with colorist uh, Paul Little, who also worked on um, I Love Trouble for us. And he's done a ton of books for, for Image. And Pat Brousseau, our uh, letterer on oh, um, awesome. both The Mercenary Sea and I Love Trouble, will be back as well. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah it's a swords and sorcery uh, adventure that... Um, it's definitely inspired, as I mentioned to you, by the Conan series, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's got a little uh, sci-fi slant to it as well. And uh, I, I basically uh, that one I pitched to um, to Image, and I said, "What if Frank Frazetta painted uh, spaghetti westerns?" And that's the sort of uh, impetus for that. You know, there's there's a little man with no name uh, dollars trilogy in there as well. Uh, so it should be a really fun adventure. You know, it's much like, uh, the mercenary sea. It's, it's, you know, it's all about adventure. <laughs> awesome. right. And when is that one starting up? That'll be, I think it'll, it's definitely January and, uh, I'm going to guess about probably January 14th is when that'll come out. And also, uh, I love trouble. Is that available collected? I love trouble is available, uh, at Amazon, uh, your most, most bookstores and, and certainly, uh, your local comic shops as well. That's awesome. So definitely check that out. Um, oh, definitely yeah. will. Yeah, I can't wait to get uh, get on that I Love Trouble as well because you're definitely uh, giving it a lot of props today. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to I go and check it out. And I've been kind of checking a little bit of it out on Google here, and I love I love the artwork. So Yeah, uh, well, I've, I've been very fortunate with all three of the artists that I've managed to work with. 
in that I found really great guys, really great artists who, um, you know, each have their own style and um, approach, but they're just all, they're all, I think, kind of breathtaking, you know? Absolutely. Well, and on top of that, I can say, which I think you would agree, both of you, it's, it's almost like being a fan of Doctor Who. There is always a Doctor that is your first, and when you find out there's something beforehand, you want to go for you want to go and find it out. Yeah, you want to see who the previous actor, how the previous actor handled it. Or in, the, in this case, your previous work, because, you know, as you may have guessed, Ryan and I are both big fans of your work so far. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I think that's going to continue Hopefully for quite some time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will. Hey, I just well, want you'll, to... You'll be, hearing, <laughs> you'll be hearing from us if it doesn't. We're actually <laughs> going to do a... There'll be a, a little advanced sneak pre- peek of Rain in... The November issue of the Mercenary Sea, a little five-page uh, short story that'll introduce you to the characters. Oh, awesome! So, uh, if you're fans of Mercenary Sea, you'll probably already be checking that out. We definitely will. Well, um, well, two things. Hopefully, uh, next year when Niagara Falls Comic Con comes around, we get to see you at some point. <laughs> uh, you know, I got. I, I really do have to work on getting out to the cons more. Uh, obviously, my work keeps me sort of yeah. centrally located in LA. And you're pretty I, I went busy down to San it. Diego for a day. I was quite overwhelming, actually. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I definitely plan on as my footprint in comics gets bigger, and I just don't think I'm there yet mm-hmm. in terms of uh, you know building up a fan base uh, or even just sort of uh, an audience that's at least aware of what I'm doing. Um, but you know, obviously, shows like this will help, and and hopefully, you guys can tell your friends and your fans and your, your listeners about uh, what, what we got going on here. But. We definitely will. Well, I just want to say thanks so much, Cal, for coming on the show. Um, thanks was, for having me, guys. Yeah, huge honor for, for you to come out here. Um, well, as usual, thanks for uh, being on and being my co-host. And As uh, always, a pleasure. And to everybody out there who's listening, uh, you know, we do have fans in uh, California. We have fans in Minnesota. We have some fans in Stockholm, we just found out. Um, it's fantastic. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you all from the bottom of my heart. It's uh, great to get together with uh, you geeks every single week. And uh, always follow us online at Ryan's All Things Geek. Check out the Mercenary C from Image. Check out Rain coming out soon. Guys, we like to just say thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, also another big thank you to Black Magic for playing us out. It's Rat G on 103.7 FM, CFBU, Brock University, St. Catharines, and we're out. Yeah. Yeah. Black magic. You got 